day by day. I know that feeling. They tried to kill me yesterday at the MRI. Because I had to lay on my stomach and put my hand out in front one at a time. Anybody remembers Joel Staub, my brother. Yes. This is his son, and he's visiting from Michigan. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you today. 
And also, um, Graham Shell, would you introduce your visitor? Yeah, this is my father in law, Frank. And uh, if Anna and I don't start coming to church more, we're going to be looked at like visitors. Anyway. <laughs> And you're visiting from Indiana, right? Exactly. Wonderful. Well, it's glad that you're here. We're glad that you're here this morning. And I believe there's one more visitor. One more visitor. Brother Zach, is there another visitor here today? <laughs> He's in the nursery. He's in the nursery? All right. Well, Maverick Laflam is in the building somewhere. And we're glad that you brought him to church today. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. How old is he now? He's 10 days old. 10 days old. So praise the Lord. Wonderful. Keep praying for the lambs. Brother Zach, you look a little tired. <laughs> Wonderful. If you're a little warm this morning, the one AC isn't working, so we will get that fixed this week, hopefully. Uh, but uh, the other one is working double, double time. <laughs> we have a teen activity scheduled for this coming Friday. That's the 19th uh, at 6 p.m. It's going to be at our house. If you need uh, directions to our house, please see me. Uh, the teens can be dropped off at about 6, and they'll be ready for pickup about 8.30. We are going to have a good old time. Matter of fact, uh, this past Wednesday, I was talking to some teens, and I said, we're going to have a teen activity at our, we're going to have a teen activity this Friday. And they said, well, can it be at your house? And I said, sure. We haven't had one at our house in a while, so that's fine. So we're going to have a teen activity at our house, and Sarah always makes something good to eat, and then we have some fun and uh, have a devotion from God's voice. So. If you know any teens and think you'd like to invite them, please let me know uh, if they say yes so that we can get them squared away with finding out where we live and everything. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. All right, teenagers, you'll want to come. Was it Friday night you said? Yes. Friday night because uh, I probably shouldn't tell you this. But Pastor Stevens has a lot of yard work he needs. To do. <laughs> and that's why he's having to work in his house. Right. Yeah, that would be good. All right, good to have That's a good there. idea for next time. <laughs> well, they've been worn down. All right, great to see all of you here. Thank you for coming. Pleasure to have you as always. Let's have a prayer. Father, we pray in gratefulness unto thee, thanking thee for all that thou hast done for us. You sent your son. He accomplished the mission that you sent him to accomplish. And now we're waiting on his return from heaven again. Thank you that thou wilt fulfill all of thy promises. We have but to wait and keep trusting and obey in the meantime. So help us to remember those things. May this service today be pleasing unto thee. We are here in thy name. We are here to honor thee. So may our thoughts be centered upon thee, and may they be so strongly committed to thee so that we think about thee every day this week. May our lives conform to the thinking that we read and hear from God's word. We thank thee for the truth therein. So may this service be pleasing in thy sight. May someone hear or wherever it's heard understand the ministry of the Savior in seeking and saving that which is lost. And we're so grateful for that and will be forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Page six in your song books. Let's stand one more time before our scripture reading. We sing all three verses of I sing the mighty power of God.
this morning is coming from Psalms 119, verses 17 through 24. Again, Psalms 119, 17 through 24. In verse 17, deal bountiful with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thy eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy thy law. I am a stranger in the in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt. For I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my consolation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for uh, what you have done for us, Lord. Lord, we just ask you just to uh, be with us and continue to get into your word, Lord, and, and come to know you even more, Lord. And those that, that don't know you, Lord, that um, if, if they are not saved, Lord, that today would be their day of uh, salvation, Lord, to come to know you, Lord. And Lord, just ask you to just have your hand upon the service, be with the preacher as he brings forth your message, Lord. And it's these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
So now I want you to open up these to Matthew chapter 27. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about, where sin abounded, grace did abound more. Amen. Matthew, please, chapter 27. And in a few seconds, I'll begin reading in verse 26 and take us through verse 31 for the message this morning. Matthew, please, chapter 27, verse 26 reads, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put him on a scarlet robe. And when they had planted the crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed, smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucified him. When I was a little boy, my two cousins, it was about uh, 10 or 12 months difference between me and the one that was ahead of me and the one that was just behind me. They were brothers. We were kind of like the three musketeers or troubleteers or whatever. <laughs> the younger of the three had a speech impediment. He could not correctly pronounce some of his words, they were a little thickened. He stuttered once in a while. He went to a number of speech classes when he was a little boy. Nothing ever seemed to work too well for him. So when he comes up into seven and eight years of age, he's a little bit behind in school. And oftentimes the three of us were together. Now we lived a few miles apart, but me not having brothers and sisters, and those two brothers, they to me were like brothers. So all the three of us were together so often. His older brother and myself learned early in life, around grade six or, or ages six and seven, how to fight. I know you teach your children not to fight. But because of Carol's speech impediment, he was constantly being mocked on the playground and at school. Now his older brother wasn't going to stand for that. So my uncle, their dad, had boxing gloves for us. And when the three of us were together, especially I and Carol's older brother, we boxed each other. And that was all in fun. Until I got knocked out. <laughs> but nevertheless, the gloves came off when we went to the playground, and the gloves came off when we went to school. And whenever Carol was mocked, we went into action. And I mean, we, we tore into the other kids. You know? Well, that wasn't the right thing to do. I'm not telling you that it was the right thing to do. I'm just telling you what we kids did. And we did this up through junior high school. My mother remarried a man in the military, and we began to travel, so I lost this uh, weekly contact with my two pseudo-brothers. Things kind of settled out a little bit for Carol. But I can recall so many times where Carol was mocked because he could not speak plainly. Yet listen very carefully to what he said. The kids made fun of him. And as I said, we took up for Carol where Carol couldn't take up for him, so now he was a big kid, but he just, he couldn't wrestle like we could, he couldn't throw punches like we could. So he stepped back in the background and we stepped forward. And here we are ready to fight anybody that wants to continue to mock his brother and my cousin. Mocking is uh, what kids do. In fact, the word in its etymology comes from a word that means to act like a child because children often do what I've just described to you. But often adults will do the same thing. There's some adults, not all. They mock other people. They make fun of other people. And I guess in the 
distorted thinking of individuals is the way you lift yourself up is by putting somebody else down. You say, well, that's not true. I agree with you. That's not true. You don't really put yourself up by putting somebody else down. <clears throat> so when you mock somebody and you try to make them appear as an idiot, they're not idiots. They just are made to appear that way in the bystanders. Then that's called mocking. It can carry over, as I've already warned, into adulthood if we're not careful. For the Son of God, he's been mocked several times throughout the night of his greatest trial. It's not over. I read about it this morning. I'm going to preach from it now and hopefully get you to see things in a little bit different light than perhaps you just casually observe in Scripture. The idea of mocking Jesus Christ was to scorn him. It was to ridicule him. It was to show contempt to him. It was to make him appear as though he was unworthy of any decent treatment. It was cruel. And according to Roman law, it was even criminal. That is, since he was under the term of crucifixion discouraging. In verse 26, when Pilate had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then it goes into a scourging in verse 27. Now I'm going to give you an opinion. I do this once in a while when I preach because it's my imagination. This is how I'm visualizing what's going on. And I always caution you that when the preacher tells you this is my imagination, this is how I'm understanding what's happening, it doesn't mean that it actually happened exactly as the preacher said. What you want exact is right here on the page of the book. Yeah. So it appears as though in verse 26, he had scourged Jesus, and then, having scourged him, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, scourging took place with the use of a whip. I'll describe the whip, and most of you are aware of it anyway, but I'd like to give you my understanding of it in a few minutes. Is it possible, this is just imagination now, that when Jesus was standing nearby and Pilate is washing his hands of the whole affair in the previous verses? In other, in other words, I, I want this issue out of my control. I'm no longer responsible for what's happening. So he borrowed, as I told you last Sunday morning, from I think the 29th chapter of Deuteronomy. Nevertheless, a procedure whereby judges for Israel when they could not come to a firm decision that the person who had been arrested needed to be indicted and put on trial. There wasn't enough evidence as far as they were concerned. Then they would do exactly <coughs> what Pilate did. Take a bowl of water, put your hands in it, raise it up two or three times like this. I'm washing my hands. I'm done with this. I'm finished. Whoever you've arrested is allowed to go free as far as I or the other judges are concerned. And really that was the end of the matter. So Pilate is in attempt mocking the Jews by going back to one of their customs whereby he's now going to stand before them with a basin of water and wash his hands and say, I found nothing wrong with this fellow. I'm washing my hands on the whole affair. You do whatever you want. And they said, well, we want him to be crucified. And he's already said, then you do what you want. He's given them permission to see him crucified. Is Pilate finished with this issue? No, he's not finished at all. There's more to come. Is he to be held responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Yes, he is. But then those who just like Jewish people say, well, no, wait a minute, I disagree with that because actually it, it was the Jews who called for the crucifixion. And that's true. It was Pilate who had him put on the cross and crucified. They're both guilty, Jew and Gentile. So we dare not place blame one or the other. When the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, keep in mind that if all have sinned, uh, I suppose that's all the Jews. I suppose that's all the Gentiles. All that ever lived are living or ever will live. I'm assuming all means all. So when all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, accept the Bible exactly as it's written. So Pilate has washed his hands of the affair. And I'm kind of making an idea in my mind in verse 26 that maybe 
with Jesus standing nearby is possible. It's not in the scripture. It's just my idea, please. That he may have called upon one of the soldiers nearby who was accustomed to afflicting the scourging to give him a few lashes right there. After all, that would be another mark on Pilate's part, if you please, at his attempt to bring contempt upon the Jews. He hated the Jews. And the feeling was mutual. Pilate delighted in executions. He was a cruel individual. He had no compassion upon anyone. And any time he could find a reason to put a Jew upon a cross in crucifixion, which was well known in those days, he took advantage of it. So they were accustomed, wherever they traveled up and down Israel, to occasionally seeing a cross with a live or a dead body hanging upon it. It was Pilate's way of saying, this is a reminder, not a so gentle one, however, of who is in charge. And in this part of Israel, I am in charge. That was Pontius Pilate. So he may have had him scourged, flogged, beaten a little bit there. And then we come to verse 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall. That was a very large area, a judgment hall, if you please. It would accommodate quite a bit of people. But I want to call your attention to a phrase at the end of verse 27 because I think that's quite significant. And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Now, all words in the scripture, the Bible says, are given by inspiration of God. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God. It must extend the very words themselves or forget it. Then you might as well make up your own idea of what's going on, which I do sometimes and warn you, and I've told you that already three or four times, this is the imagination. But now we're back to actual scripture. A band of Roman soldiers or a cohort, C-O-H-O-R-T, was composed of some four and sometimes 600, 400 to 600 Italian and foreign soldiers who had enlisted in the Roman army. There was this cohort temporarily stationed in Jerusalem, just outside the temple wall, barracked in a couple of very large buildings. And the buildings were built high enough so that they could overlook the wall that was surrounding the temple area and always observe, as they did 24 hours a day it seemed, what was going on in what was called Temple Square, some 34, 35 acres. Now some of them are going to be sleeping, some are going to be arising out of their sleep. Some are full of duty at night, and they're going to be getting ready to perhaps uh, party a little bit, and then they'll eventually, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, I suppose, take their rest. When the Bible says in verse 27, the whole band of soldiers is called out, it is as though Pilate snaps his fingers and says, I want all, I want all out here lined up. Now you're talking about arousing the whole band, at least 400, possibly as many at times as 600 soldiers. Why does Pilate want 400 to 600 soldiers surrounding a common hall in verse 27, whereby a few dozen, perhaps at the most on the inside, are going to beat this man within an inch of his life? Why do you need all those soldiers? He said, well, do you have an answer? Well, I have one that satisfies me. But after all, I have an imagination. And so in my imagination, at this feast time, the feast of Passover, the very day on which Passover feast began after sundown that Friday, Jerusalem has within its environs and all around it, according to historians writing from those days, at least a million people have come in from the outside from all over Israel and foreign countries. They understood that they were required by Jewish law to appear at least three times a year 
unless providentially hindered. So on the hillsides of the previous Sunday, on the east side of the city, would have been thousands of tents of sorts put up for people to stay in for the several days they are there to observe the Passover week. Jesus comes down from the top of the Mount of Olives, across the little valley, um, and up into Jerusalem, and in so doing, is hailed by those out-of-town guests, mainly, I would think, made up of Galileans. Now, Galilee is the northern part of the country. Remember, Jesus was a Galilean. Jesus was from Nazareth. Remember also that most of his ministry was in the northern part of the country. He was more well-known up there than he was down south, but he was more hated down south and very little opposition up north. And they're there. And on that previous Sunday, we call it Palm Sunday, he allowed himself to be hailed as king of the Jews, sent by the Lord. He could not deny that. That was his mission. So we call that his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now in the meantime, through the last several days, between last Sunday and this Friday, the powers that were had done their best to stir up opposition to Jesus. What's happening right now is taking place around probably six, maybe even seven o'clock in the morning. And most people got up just like a lot of people do today, except that when it became dark time, they pretty much went to bed. And a lot of our people stay up watching TV at all hours of night and doing whatever they want to do. But nevertheless, those people, when the sun begins to come up, they're up. Sometimes with Americans, when the sun comes up, they're covering up their heads. <laughs> and they're trying to pretend as though it's just not time. It can't be. Well, you need to go to bed at a decent hour and get up at a decent hour. And so on the hillsides, uh, people are stirred. All this now is taking place right across a very small valley. I've been there so many times, so it's in my mind. It's hard to describe for you. The Mount of Olives is somewhat higher than the temple area. Let me get it backwards. Uh, the Mount of Olives for you would be over here, and the temple would be over here. So all along the side of the Mount of Olives, thousands of any kind of shelters available are put up to house tens of thousands of people who cannot find lodging inside the city of Jerusalem. There's just not enough places. All the hotels and so forth are filled. You say, well, did they have hotels? Yeah, they have hotels, not like you think of. And it didn't have near as many as you would imagine. So all the way around the city of Jerusalem this time, there are millions, it seemed, but they're there. And they are going to be coming in and out of the city. And there is a big ruckus and a crowd has gathered very early in the morning at the urging of the ruling body of the Jews to be present in order to make legal what they had done throughout the night, which was illegal, all of it illegal. So now they're going to all of a sudden justify everything that has happened for the last almost 12 hours and they'll have a formal meeting in the morning and they'll make it all legal and then they will approach Pilate. <clears throat> now, I don't think Pilate's up yet. It's possible, but probably not. Now, Pilate's not in a good mood. A lot of people, uh, in the morning, you want to remember to never wake up grumpy. Just let them sleep. Now, you'll get that some of you later on, but it's okay. And so I'm imagining that Pilate now has been awakened because there's a large crowd of people outside his official residence. He's going to have to get dressed. He's going to have to come into the judgment hall. And now we're back to this whole band of soldiers. Why are they there? Jesus came, I told you, out of Galilee. He was very popular in Galilee. He was so popular that some believed that he was the Messiah. In fact, he chose 11 out of 12 disciples from Galilee. These men believed in him. They believed that he was sent from God. They believed that he was a divine messenger from God. They devoted their lives to living with him for three or so years in order that they might be his understudies. They heard all of his sermons. 
They listened to all of his lessons. They saw, I'm guessing now, hundreds, maybe thousands of miracles, primarily up in their part of the country. Now they are at this time somewhat in hiding because Jesus dismissed them several hours prior at his arrest. And Pilate wants a whole band of soldiers because there are a lot of Galileans out there. <coughs> a lot of them have put their trust in Jesus. Others have hailed him as a hero. They believe that he really was the Christ, but the kind of Christ that they were looking for was not the Christ that he really was. They were looking for a political military leader. And they believed that if all the power that Jesus had expressed in his miracles in Galilee, this man has the power of God upon him. Now that doesn't mean they're born again. It just means that they believe that he was the power of God personified. Pilate is no stranger to Jesus. He's heard about him. He may have even heard him from time to time. I don't know. But he's not interested in a <coughs> religious leader. He's not interested in Jewish law. He's not interested in anything the Jews do unless they create a problem for him. And these Galileans can create a problem. Let's suppose that there are 500 or 1,000 or two or 3,000 of them. This doesn't have anything to do with anything, but it comes to mind. So sometimes when it comes to mind, it'll help you visualize something. It's like a small police force going up against a mob of riotous protesters. What can they do? What are they going to do? They're overpowered. So Pilate brings in, not a good analogy, Pilate brings in the National Guard. Well, if you get it, why? He wants to be protected. That's why I think he calls for four to six hundred Roman soldiers dressed in their battle regalia, dressed as on duty, and he wants them as quick as possible. So in verse 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall. Now you're not going to put 400 to 600 men in this hall. It was just never big enough and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They're there to protect Pilate. After all, Pilate is going to, if I can use the words of the president in a week and a half ago, dominate the streets. And that's why they are there. Just my imagination. I don't read any of that in the Bible. I don't care whether you read it or not. I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, He's going to be stripped in verse 28 and put on him or placed on him a scarlet robe. This is a short clip. This is not Hollywood script. This is a short clip of some six, seven, eight feet at the most. There are pieces of bone and metal tied into the end of the whip. The one who's being whipped is going to have his body like this between posts. He's tied to this post. He's tied to this post. He's tied so high up that he's not going to be able to do much movement except a little bit this way and that way, and that's about it. He's stripped. What's that mean? Well, it means probably what you think it means. He's stripped. God of creation is stripped. He's tied. It's not just to give him a whipping. It's to see if he can survive the lashes of the Roman whip. A soldier would stand behind him. Keep in mind, he's, he's like this. And to a side, the soldier would stand and just snap that whip and wrap it around the body. 
is not to take a whip and beat him on the back. The idea is to tear his flesh, not mark his flesh, tear it. Now imagine that short whip being just laid on the back and it wraps itself around to the front of the victim. And then he jerks it. Now what's the glass and the bone going to do to the rib cage? <coughs> it will rip it in shreds. It won't take many lashes like that to rip the whole front of his abdomen area, his chest all the way down. It's ripped. Most men did not survive the scourging. Didn't take many lashes. So there could be a lot of marks on his back, but the front is different. And they simply jerk the whip back. And the bone and the glass has embedded itself in the skin and they're ripping the skin. That's why I told you, most never survive. Vital organs can be seen within a matter of an hour or less death follows. So don't you fall for these paintings and I realize that the paintings of <coughs> medieval Europe were done by master painters. I can admire their artwork and so forth. But they paint a skinny, thin, emaciated. Now this is not politically correct and it's going out around the world. And I may get feedback on Facebook, even though I'm not on Facebook, I'll hear about it. A thin, skinny, emaciated, female looking individual on the cross. They have him with the long dangling hair, the sunken face. He has been beaten before. He was beaten by the Sanhedrin during the night. He has been bleeding a lot. His face is uh, somewhat emaciated because of the blows that the Jewish judicial leadership has delivered upon a man they could not convict of a crime. But they've beaten him to a pulp. But he's still a man. He's all of a man. And he stands there lashed to the post and he endures it. All of it. You see, he's not only a man, He's not a weakling. But he is a God man. And when he determines that he is, his life will expire, he will exert his authority upon the cross. And he will cry out, It is finished. And he'll bow his head and say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. On that line. They won't kill him. They can't. Who can kill God? What an idiotic thought. And he will breathe out his life from his own will. He will willingly die. The scarlet robe is for dignity in the eyes of Rome. That was color, this red or scarlet or purple robe. Inside, there will be the, the typical laughter at him, the jeering, during leaders, edging on the other soldiers, or edging on them. A uh, regiment of clowns, I'm never in the military, but I suppose there's always one or two, always cracking jokes and making fun and mocking other people. And then there'll be the bullies for those who say, I don't really want to participate in this. And then the bullies come around. Yeah, you're going to participate. You're part of the squadron. You'll do what you're told. So, he's stripped. He's clothed with a scarlet robe in verse 28. 
Do you realize that in the Bible, scarlet's the color of our sin? How many of you, let me show up hands if you will. How many of you ever read or used the wordless book? Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you, most of you know. A little book without any printing in it, just colors. Starts out with a color of black and moves forward and so forth. Uh, a good way, especially with children, to present the gospel. However, there is only one thing wrong with it. In the Bible, black is not the color of sin. Scarlet's the color of sin. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, not as black, as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red, not black, like crimson, they shall be as wool. <coughs> Nice little book. But some of the things that sometimes we use, even some of the songs that we sing, are not quite accurate. So the little wordless book is not exactly accurate. And then the crown of thorns are placed upon his head to represent in the eyes of Rome his kingship, his lordship, his sovereignty. Have you remember that in Genesis chapter 3 that there is a curse placed upon the earth, a curse of thorns and thistles? And he becomes cursed. He bears the curse of original sin, as we call it. The sin of Adam and Eve, rebellion against God, that's what it was. He bears it. He's cursed for God so that we can be restored to God. Then the reed, oh yes, the reed. They had planted in verse 29 a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. And they put a reed, just a, a silly reed, like cutting out of wool, I should somewhere. And they put it in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and they mock him. Hail the king. Hail the king. Rejoice. We rejoice in you, King. And then the Bible says in verse 30, they spit upon him. Whoever spits in the face of a king. And then they take the reed away from him. And they take this as though they're saying, I gave you the authority to be king. And now on behalf of Rome, I'm taking it away from you. I have a right to give it to you. I have a right to take it back. And they took back the reed and beat him over the head with it. And after they had mocked him in verse 31, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Let me see if I get this right. He's scourged. We go free. He's crowned and mocked. And we are clothed in his righteousness. He receives contempt and scorn and ridicule. And we receive grace and peace. They bow before him in mockery. They reject him. And God receives us and calls us kings and priests unto him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Remember Revelation 19 when he returns again. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. 
From 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and after this reading, I'm going to have a close of prayer. Lord, with brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news that I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that Christ, how I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that's the gospel. That's why he died. Stand with us in prayer. It's about eyes are closed. I closed out last Sunday morning's message, which I cannot do today, with an old gospel song, What Do We Do With Jesus? And I asked that question of you. When I was first introduced to the biblical Jesus, and I went to Sunday school and church as I was taught the Bible stories almost every Sunday in Sunday school. But it wasn't until I was in my mid-teens that I ever heard of the real Jesus, the one who died for sinners. I was never really taught in Sunday school that I had a need because they told me all you need to do to be a Christian is to let us baptize you and join the church. And so I did. But I never met the real Jesus. I never really understood him until those mid-teens when I heard the gospel. Christ died for me. And then I had to come face to face with, what will I do with Jesus? Yeah, what will I do? And for three Sundays, I thought, I'm not doing anything. I'm as good a Christian as anybody else. And I knew nothing about it. And finally, I listened and I heard. And I wept with a tear or two, and standing in the back of the little auditorium, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I asked him to forgive me and save me. Will you do that? If you've never done it, will you do it now? I went on my being baptized. Will you trust Christ as your Savior? In a few seconds, we're going to sing. We're going to listen at least to say the prayer. Usually we do have an invitation just as an answer. This is a good way to be asked. What are you going to do with Jesus? Will you come to him this morning? Surrender your life to it. Say, preacher, I'm not sure that I'm I'm saved. But God wants you to be sure. Will you trust Him? Trust means you put your faith in someone. You rely upon that individual. What are you going to do with Jesus? Come quickly. Come right now. Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I trust in Christ.